Welcome, everybody. Today is the December 12th, 2023 Aim for Inclusion uh, session. It's uh, the third in an eight-part series about assistive, uh, accessible educational materials and um, accessibility in educational programs. And we're thrilled to have you here today. Your Zoom sign-in is your record of attendance for the contact hours that you can um, earn for today's session. And you'll see the uh, link here for the handouts um, that, that we will be posting. Also, you'll see in the chat a link to the handouts that Michelle and Kelly have shared with us um, already today. And it's it'll be the same handouts for uh, for both of those uh, links. The series that we're doing, as I said, is an eight-part series about accessible educational materials for inclusion, and it is sponsored by the Oregon Technology Access Program, which is a program that's operated at Douglas Education Service District and uh, funded by the Oregon Department of Education. Um, so I said that, uh, you'll see up in the right hand corner of, of the, uh, slide here, our logo for the AIM, uh, cohort, the Oregon AIM cohort, uh, Deb Fitzgibbons is with us today and she's the facilitator for the AIM cohort project and also of the Oregon Technology Access Program and Regional Services for Students with Orthopedic Impairments. Um, again, Deb works at Douglas ESD and you can see your contact information here in case you have questions or concerns or uh, great ideas that you'd like to share with us so that we can do a better job of serving uh, your needs. I'm Gail Bowser. I'll be the facilitator for today's session. Um, I work as an independent consultant and I work uh, in a variety of programs around the United States, but the Oregon Technology Access Program is my, is my home uh, program and I'm always glad to be able to work with OTAP as we do this important work. We wanted to especially stress today that Oregon is one of the seven states that has been chosen as a partner with the National AIM Center to participate in an, a technical assistance grant. Um, we've talked at each session about what accessible educational materials are, and we'll learn more today about choosing the right accessible educational materials for uh, students that you work with. But I especially wanted to call out the uh, the AIM, National AIM Center today because both of our speakers are members of the staff at the National AIM Center, which is operated by CAST, and we're really excited to have them. We will always want to say that you're welcome to um, unmute yourself, to ask questions in the chat or um, participate in this conversation in any way that, that you want to. Our, we believe that these sessions especially are really enhanced by open conversations and the questions that you ask because in, in fact, we're just still learning a lot about AIM and how to uh, infuse it into schools and make sure that kids have the accessible materials they need. And it's your comments and your contributions that help us learn even more at every session. Next time, our next session will be on January 16th. And there I am again. I'll be um, offering a session about documentation of accessible educational materials in the IEP. And it'll tag on to today's session about making any decisions because we'll talk about the actual consideration requirements in the Oregon IEP. Um, which is listed in the special factors part of our IEP form here in, o in Oregon. But today we are very excited to have two highly qualified speakers. We have Michelle and Kelly. They are both, as I mentioned, 
uh, staff on the National Center for Accessible Educational Materials, and uh, both have the title of technical assistance specialist, but I'm gonna let them tell you more about themselves. So I'm going to stop sharing and welcome Kelly and Michelle. Thanks for being here today. Thank you for having us. We are so excited about this next hour that we have with you in Oregon. We were talking earlier about we're in three different time zones. I'm in Eastern time. So it's six o'clock, Michelle's in Central time. So we're just grateful that we showed up on the right time. So thanks for being here with us, right, Michelle? <laughs> You're muted, my friend. That is absolutely right. But we are so excited to be here with you all talking about something that is just so passionate to our hearts um, as the work that we all do. But also some of us have personal experiences with it. I know I do as a mom of a kiddo who... Um, receive special education services. So really thrilled to talk today about decision making mm -hmm. and accessible formats. So um, before we jump in, um, Kelly, why don't you take us over our accessibility commitment? Yeah, so we do work at the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials. So we want to make sure that um, we model the importance of accessibility. So you're gonna notice that our slides and any materials that we show you, they're really simple. And so we follow the principles, principles of poor, which, which is perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. So what do we mean by that? is when you access our slides or a home-based document that we put into the chat box, we have alt text on all of our images, high contrast color, our fonts readable, we'll have captions on all of our videos, um, distinct uh, titles on our slides, so it's very predictable when we go to each slide, um, the clear structure and layout. Um, and if anytime we have an image on our slides, it's intentional and for a reason, so it's not a barrier to accessing our slides at all. And then robust, so checking for accessibility. So we really like to point out um, things that we're doing intentionally in case you're wanting to implement those pieces in your practice, that accessibility is definitely in the forefront of this entire presentation. And as um, we go throughout um, this hour, and if you have any problems accessing any of the content at all, um, please uh, reach out to us anytime. All right. So with that, um, let us introduce ourselves. So a little bit more about myself. I am a technical assistance um, specialist at CAST. I primarily work 100% of my time on the National AIM Center, and I have the wonderful pleasure of working with our intensive technical assistance, which consists of the seven states that um, currently uh, make up our AIM cohort. So our um, really our goal is to build systems to vet best practices with our states that truly identify ways to make the systems better when we're thinking about providing accessible educational materials and accessible technology for students who require them. And I just have the amazing pleasure of working with Kelly, who I'll pass it on over so she can tell you a little bit about herself as well. Hi, friends. So I am Kelly Suiting. I'm the other technical assistant specialist at the National Center on um, AIM. And so I am delighted to be here. Um, I'm super passionate about this work. And um, just a little bit of background about myself, because um, you all are coming from different backgrounds. And Michelle and I definitely come from boots on the ground. And that's where our kind of our wheelhouse is. Although we work, you know, with states and districts now in our cohorts, um, we definitely have that experience and can really relate to perhaps the positions and your current roles that you're in. So we really like to break down uh, terms that are more of understandable, more plain language, so we can all understand no matter where you're starting from. So um, I... Um, I am on the universal uh, technical assistance with the AIM Center. So that's more of the dissemination, creating our online uh, learning modules and topics, uh, the podcast, um, just disseminating our publications and the website and things like that. So that's me. We're getting ready to launch some we a webinar series. And so that's something that I will provide as well. Um, I am still a licensed teacher in Indiana, although I now live in Virginia on the East Coast. Whoop, whoop. Um, so um, yeah, so my background is general ed and special education, and I worked for a great education agency in Indiana for the previous 10 years before uh, joining CAS last year at, at the Patents Project. And so there I was, a, I supported the entire state of Indiana. And so my areas of support were students with learning disabilities and autism, and then lots of professional development around UDL, AIM, and AT. So really ensuring that all students were getting materials in a timely manner and supporting districts and the state in creating those policies and procedures. So again, Michelle and I um, hope, hope 
hopefully we're going to be super relatable to you. We're both super laid back. So feel free to unmute yourself and put anything into the chat because we want to make sure that this is the most meaningful and engaging next hour with us that it can possibly be because we are really um, are appreciate and value your time. So what do you think, friend? All right. So what you're going to want to um, consider opening and downloading um, both of these, um, either the QR code or the link that we have dropped in chat will take you to what we call our home based document. Our home based document, let me go ahead and pull that over so that I can show you what it looks like. When you open it up, you will see a document that has, um, first of all, I want to point out that it is accessible. You can um, really maneuver through the document by opening up the left hand side outline and it will take you to each section. But in the document, you have access to our slide deck. So what we're presenting, um, it gives you a bit.ly code for the home based document. Um, you know, it has listed our objectives. Any of the links that we're going to be sharing today, whether it be um, a video link or a resource, you have access to those in order as we go through them on this document. I do want to uh, point out that you're going to notice that one of these links are it's highlighted yellow at the very bottom. And um, let me make that bold as well, just so that there's twofold. Um, the reason for that is because we're going to be asking you later on through the session to open this up. And it is a forced copy so that you can take notes. We're going to be using some student profiles as we think about decision making. Um, so if you want to go ahead and click on it, that's perfectly fine. But so that it's easier to find, it will be bold and highlighted in yellow for when we do have that opportunity to explore those. Um, if there's any additional resources and links that we uh, mentioned today, feel free to include them. If you have resources and links that you're like, hey, this is really great information that we want to share. Sharing is caring. So feel free to go ahead and maneuver this document, place them at the bottom there. This is a document for all of us to learn and um, really take away so that we can utilize it in the work that we do. All right, so our objectives for today. Kelly, do you want to walk us through some of these objectives here? Yeah, so we're going to just scaffold throughout the whole time uh, within this hour. And so um, we want to start with understanding what accessibility means as far as in any space, um, especially with it, when it comes to literacy access, um, the distinguish between AIM and accessible format. So AIM, when we're saying AIM, we mean accessible educational materials and the distinction between both of those and really having conversations about the process of how to ensure that students are getting those appropriate uh, formats that they need. And then we're gonna use a four-step process for ensuring the timely provision of the use of accessible formats. So timely manner, we typically say that's at the same time as our as our students peers. So um, that's our goal for today. Love it. And for timely manner, just one addition on that. Mm -hmm. um, so IDEA tells us that every state needs to have and adopted its own definition for timely manner. Most of the states do um, align to uh, the definition that Kelly just shared. You know, they should be receiving their materials at the same time as their non-disabled peers. However, um, Oregon's wording might be a little bit different than New Hampshire's wording, than Texas wording, because every state is adopting its own definition. So make sure you go check out what is the organ definition of timely manner um, and go on a scavenger hunt to identify what the language is that, that you're utilizing. I bet well, Gail Michelle, can. I, I'd be happy to say that Oregon's definition is at the same time as other students are getting their materials. So mm -hmm. um, if, if people want to do a scavenger hunt, they can find the actual um, ORS, but we're uh, doing that the right way, we think. I love it. Yep, absolutely. So a little bit about the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials at CAST. So we are housed at CAST, um, but within CAST, there's two technical assistance centers. And honestly, the goal of the technical assistance centers, specifically the AIM Center, is to build capacity of states and district agencies and other outside agencies and organizations. And it's really to support that high quality accessible educational materials and accessible technologies in a timely manner for all students pre-K through 12 to post-secondary. Um, 
As Kelly mentioned before, we do have three different layers of technical assistance that we provide. Kelly is phenomenal at our universal technical assistance. That includes anything that anybody and everybody can access. It is available through webinar or on our website. It's resources that have been vetted, that have been designed and have been posted so that everybody can benefit from it. Um, we also have targeted technical assistance and targeted at this current time at CAST and National AIM Center means that we are providing specific um, support to specific groups. So we have early childhood um, learning, um, higher education and workforce development that we particularly target um, and provide. It's not consecutive. It's spontaneous support um, really identified for those areas. And then what Oregon is a part of is our intensive technical assistance. And this is um, where we have continuous ongoing partnerships. It was a five-year grant cycle where our states have networked, they've worked together, they've utilized things that we call quality indicators to help them build and develop systems um, to provide services, materials to the students in a timely manner. And so within the state, they have three, each have identified three districts that they really work together with to pilot information and to solicit in, uh, feedback from the districts because it's the state level working with um, district level working with boots on the ground. So we wanna make sure that it's seamless um, throughout all of those areas. Yeah, and the reason so, why we kind of take that time to break down those those three tiers of a technical assistance because you're all are not from Oregon. And so um, no matter what state you're from, just know that after the session's over, you still have access to us. So we're a nonprofit education agency. So um, feel free to reach out to us anytime for support. If you want to expand on any anything that we've gone over today or have any questions about our resources, just know that you have Michelle and I beyond this time. Absolutely. And just to highlight our seven states who have done just an amazing um, job in the work that they've been doing. We have Georgia, Missouri, New Hampshire, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Oregon, and West Virginia. So to start off, we want to first and foremost develop a shared understanding of accessible. When you think about the word accessible, what comes to your mind? And what we're going to do right now is what we call a waterfall chat. And so first, we want you to think about when you hear that word accessible, what words pop into your mind? And right now, y'all, there's no right or wrong answer, right? It's just brainstorming. But don't, don't put it in chat just yet. So just take a moment to think. On step two, we're going to type it in the chat, but we're not going to hit enter. And then step three, when we say hit enter, you're going to see a flood of ideas of what people are thinking about when they hear the word accessible. So here we go. Step one, go ahead and think about your words. Step two, go ahead and type it in chat, but don't hit enter. And step three, enter. Oh. Equitable participation. Easy to get to. Everyone. Everyone. Able to be used by all. Ease of use. Wow, these are amazing. The ability to access something with the same amount of ease as everyone else. Y'all kiss your brains. <laughs> It's amazing. One other thing that we like to note is that oftentimes, you know, when we have the more people we have and the more ideas we have, everybody's thinking of something a little bit different when we think about accessible. Mm -hmm. So it's really important as we start this journey of learning about decision making, learning about that foundational piece, we have to have a, a common understanding of what is it that we mean when we're talking about accessible educational materials? What is it that we're meaning when we're talking about accessibility? Yes. And I would just like to throw in there. We're, so we're talking about accessible educational materials. Just because something's digital does not mean it's accessible. It just means it's available. And so hopefully by this four-step process, we can really vet and decide what is accessible and not just available in a digital format. 
So what better way to really start off um, the session than to identify um, voices from the field? Let's hear from some of those students who rely on accessible educational materials and Test. hear what they have to say. What do you wish people knew about accessibility? One of the things that I wish people knew about accessibility was that it isn't easy to learn how to use uh, coming from the person who actually needs the accessibility. They also think that some of these things, um, you just turn it on and you can use it. But um, come to realize that using stuff like screen readers, we don't just wake up learning how to use those things. Ileana, it took Ileana years to learn how to use her voiceover at 100% even though uh, she was born legally blind. And I think it's important that people have patience and when they have patience and understand that it's a learning process, they can better accommodate um, those who need accessibilities. And I also like to agree with uh, my peers. I think a lot of their points are very important. Uh, accessibility is definitely not a choice. Um, like Ella said, without accessibility, we. Uh, um, the people who need accessibility options wouldn't be able to do very simple things like read a textbook or even find a street sign. So I think it's important that people understand that it's not a choice, it's a necessity. So I wish people knew that, uh, like just how important it is for things to be accessible, to have a more deeper understanding of it. I also think it's important that they should um, take more input about accessibility from people who need the accessibility. It affects everyone very differently. So what they think might work for a certain group of people might not work for every group of people in this community. Uh, everyone is different and they should take some more input from the people who they are trying to help. I wanted to be a part of this project because I think it isn't very noticed and I realize that a lot when I talk to people about that I'm doing it. And they really, when I tell them about just speech text technology, not all people know what that is. As a filmmaker, sort of something different that I've never done before and something more important in the role of society than I've ever done before. Gaming is a social thing. And I feel like if a lot of people can be involved in gaming, you can bring a lot of people together and uh, just get more people to be exposed to your stuff. It will be very useful to have people on the team that are visually impaired or need accessibility because then it can help one, like, not just the spectrum of what they assume, because maybe they might be like, mm, they need larger text. Well, how large of a text? Maybe someone might need a huge, huge, huge text and they don't, they don't make it that accessible for that or they might not put as much effort into the app to make it, they might make it accessible, but it might be a little bit wonky because they didn't really think it through hard enough. I love um, watching that um, piece of a video that you have access. So we just showed you a small clip to hear um, from the voices from the field, but you have the access to the entire 18 minute video. Um, and it is just so empowering um, and impactful to really hear from um, students who are really trying to help educate and let everybody understand the importance and why, the why behind accessibility. Yeah, and that makes me think, Michelle, is that um, they're talking a lot about um, the materials being accessible, also assistive technology. So we're going to talk about how those three things work, how those work together. And this hearing the voices of these learners reminds me of a student I had who loved spaghetti. Um, so this student loved spaghetti for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, loved putting spaghetti on ice cream. Like spaghetti was his thing, friends. Like that was, that defined him. He loved spaghetti so much. And so um, he had a learning disability. And he was a seventh, an eighth, seventh grader. And so he um, had accommodations to use text-to-speech, speech-to-text um, on his devices. And so he um, really could use some friends. So we're working on a lot of skills socially, how he could interact and engage with his peers. And so um, they at the school, they would have student of the month. 
And so student of the month means when you're selected, your, your face would be blown up on this picture and it'd be in the hallway of the school. And then it would list their name and have all of these things that the student liked. And I was like, yes. Yeah. So I get this call saying, Johnny was student of the month. And I was like, oh yeah, this is amazing. They're going to find out all these things about Johnny. So I went in and sure enough, there's Johnny's picture hanging up in the hallway and it said his name. And then it said his favorite food and it said fries, F-R-I-E-S. It didn't say spaghetti. And I was like, say what? So um, if you know me, you know, I did this. I went to find Johnny right away. And I was like, oh my gosh, congratulations. This is amazing. You're student of the month. Um, I noticed that you put fries as your favorite food, but knowing you, I know that you love spaghetti. What made you put fries? And so what he said was, I didn't know how to spell it. I didn't know how to spell spaghetti. And so because he could not spell spaghetti, he put fries. So this was a kiddo who not only was given this piece of paper that was not accessible to him, he had no idea. It was not meaningful and relevant to him. He had no idea what student of the month meant, what was going to happen if he filled it out. And then he did not have those needed um, accommodations, those needed resources for him to be able to show what he knows about himself. This is what happens with our students when things are not accessible to them in school. They try to change who they are to fit into the atmosphere, the culture that they are given. Whereas when the students have access to the accommodations that they need, the accessibility parts and accessing, um, they can have, you know, um, enhance their literacy skills with those accommodations is where they're really going to be able to excel. So with that said, um, the term accessibility um, in this in the sense of thinking of accessible materials is this. So this is the definition from the U.S. Department of Education that um, accessibility is shaped of what we do or interactions with the environment, right? So a person with a disability can acquire the same information, can engage in the same interactions and, in, and enjoy the same services as a person without a disability in an equally effective equally integrated manner with substantially equivalent ease of use. And so your definitions that you put in accessibility really align with this. The story of my student with spaghetti, this aligns with this. The, the materials were not accessible to, to him. Um, again, accessibility, when we think about AIM and we think about accessible technologies, we think about assistive technologies, that's at all times, friends. It's outside of the four walls of the classrooms. It's within every single subject that the student goes to to make sure that they have those materials that they need because they can really show you what they know. I love that. And to tack on to that, when we think about accessibility in the way that Kelly just explained it, and when we understand that accessibility is about individual needs of learners with disabilities, it becomes clear that we need to move beyond just asking if something is accessible, but we should also be asking to whom is it accessible? under which conditions and for which task. Yeah, and this is really as a great example. Uh, we're going to show you this quick video, and we just want you to think and wonder um, how our friend Tyler is accessing his, um, his science book. So I've entered the password, and you press the return, or it's okay. HTML content. Okay, so that's down on his device. Loaded. So I'm going to select the textbook. And to do that, I hold control option down and I go to you. And that'll just bring me up a list of links. Nothing else, just links. Link chooser menu, 24 items. 24 Using items. voiceover. So I'll press the letters for the links and that'll narrow down. So the book is called Science Explorer. So I'll press SC together like this. One item, Science Explorer 2009 Astronomy. Science Explorer 2009 Astronomy. I'll press Control Option Space to get out of the menu. So now I'm on back to the normal web page. I'll press it and it'll open up the text. It'll click the link and open up the textbook. Press HTML content. HTML content. HTML content. Safari so has new window. The textbook. Okay, so in order for Tyler to even be able to access the content that was given on his device that he's using, there's three pieces that have to work together. So that's the materials, that's the information or the content of the curriculum, that's the accessible education materials, that's the, the materials we're going to talk about that can be 
um, the text can be changed in a way into different formats, right? And so then the technology has to be accessible, whether it's the accessible technology when the text-to-speech is built in or there's a third-party um, part uh, technology that is needs to be used, which is assistive technology on that device. So all three of those need to work. And so when we said digital does not mean accessible, it just means it's available. If Tyler, in fact, had a PDF that he was uploading on his device, maybe voiceover wouldn't work because because his device wouldn't know if there was a monkey on that that textbook or there was text on there. So that textbook was accessible and had text that was editable text and just to make that in a clearer term that was used. So all three of those pieces need to work together. So when we look about Tyler on that next slide is the material part was his digital science textbook. That was the material, that's the aim. The technology was his laptop and the digital book platform that was on his laptop. And then the assistive technology that Tyler used to be able to access the information on there was voiceover, which is the screen reader that was built into his device. So all three of those things have to work uh, fluidly together in order for our students to be able to access the information um, to have that equitable experience um, in that content. I love that. And you know, one of the things whenever I first um, started learning about accessible educational materials, um, I would get really hung up on um, moving through this process. But when I heard and when I've learned the material is really the content that they're learning. What is it that the students are taking in and putting in their brains? What is it that they're understanding that content, that information? Once I realized that when we're talking about accessible educational materials, we're talking about that content piece, that information that all students are learning, then I can make the connection to, okay, well, technology is only going to be useful if the content that I'm providing is accessible and if somebody requires that assistive technology and they're not have they don't have access to it it doesn't matter if I've done the content as accessible and the technology if they can't access it it's so it truly does go together but thinking about that material piece as that information that content um, really solidified it for me yeah and I really like how you said that Michelle because when we think about that is sometimes we think, well, if Tyler didn't have voiceover, then I would just maybe read everything aloud to my students, okay? So then we can essentially become the barrier. So we think we're doing, you know, like, we'll just read everything aloud, but then we can be a barrier. Maybe we're talking too fast, we're talking too slow. It could be what we're wearing, it could be what we smell. It's like any senses that that our students may have, we can become the barrier. And I always tell these embarrassing stories. If you heard me present before, you've heard this story before, but my kiddo who was in fifth grade, my fifth grader student it was a math lesson and I was like today you're gonna know math and I pulled him out of class which is my number one mistake because he should have been in the classroom anyway had everything been accessible and so I would I talked for 10 minutes about these directions for this kiddo who I knew he was going to get this math concept and after 10 minutes of talking and engaging with him he looked at me and he said are you growing a mustache <laughs> like he was checked out, friends. I had talked way too much. I would became the barrier where he started just looking at other things that I did not exist. But um, so, I mean, you have to have broad shoulders when you work in education anyway. All of you probably high five me right now. We all we all have those stories. So had I made you know, that lesson accessible to him where he could have used voiceover, he could have used just a text reader and read those directions as fast, as slow, as many times as he needed, I would not have gone to the spa later. So I'm just kidding. Um, so <laughs> that's my two cents about being in the classroom and making sure that we are making our instruction accessible for all of our learners. Oh, that's too funny. Um, so this is just a reminder, and I know um, Gal and Deb did a wonderful job um, including this at the beginning of the session, but um, accessible educa educational materials are print and technology-based educational materials, including printed and electronic textbooks and related core materials that are designed or enhanced in a way that makes them usable across the widest range of learner variability, regardless of format. So the, an example of this could be, it, it doesn't matter if it's you're accessing it through print or digital or graphic or audio or video, everybody, it's usable across all of those. There are two different pathways to acquisition of accessible educational materials. 
one and you know what you we always want to aim for is we want to purchase accessible from the beginning um, anytime that we can include those accessibility um, expectations have those conversations and the procurement piece is always going to be best but there are times when we need to retrofit when materials present barriers and that's really um, where we're going to take a focus on today is when retrofitting is necessary um, so just a reminder this is that definition that we're, we're going for, right? And Kelly um, already mentioned, you know, just because something is digital does not mean it is accessible. And so my fingers are click happy because I just keep going forward. Um, the next definition that we want to bring to your attention, in addition to accessible educational materials, is accessible format. And what an accessible format is, is it's an alternative manner or a form that gives an eligible person access to the work when the copy or phono record in the accessible format is used exclusively by the eligible person to permit him or her to have access as feasibly and comfortably as a person without such disability. So what this is, is uh, we have to ask ourselves, what are they, what, in what form do they need to be able to take that content in? Um, are they able to use the text-based, the printed-based copy? Do they need a Braille copy? Do they need large text in order to take that content in, to access it and to make meaning of it? And so we're thinking about what is called formats, right? Accessible formats, it used to be called specialized formats. But when I think about it, I'm thinking of um, the how, right? The, the what format and how are they really gaining access to that information. This applies to copyrighted materials that contain static text and images. So images that are not editable, um, images that, you know, you can't change, it's static. Yeah. And just to kind of piggyback off of that, Michelle, is that um, oftentimes this is where we hear, like when we think about different formats and student, our students using text-to-speech or any assistive technology when it comes to um, maybe listening or accessing the text that is cheating, right? We hear that a lot. Oh my gosh, it's not fair. They're using their earbuds and they're, you know, they're, you know, able to, um, when I have to read with my eyes. So that's when the conversation happens with cheating. So um, thinking about accessible formats, just know that um, sometimes it's really difficult to have those conversations with our fellow educators who in fact feel that. So maybe it's a math class is that we need to know that every single test or assessment um, before the contents even, before the student can even get to the content being tested, there's two things, there's two barriers that the student has to get through first. First, it's a test of engagement or accessibility. Can the student interact with the paper and pencil? Um, does the student have their glasses that day? Uh, you know, what's that barrier? And then it's a test of reading. So every single test and assessment that we are giving our students, no matter what subject, it's a test of reading. So if a student is taking a math test and they cannot decode the directions to that math test, they're never going to be able to show you what they know on the on on the, the content of the math test. So that's where the accessible formats, the, the appropriate ones that the student needs is so crucial for a student to truly be able to express what they know, because lack of knowledge does not mean lack of intelligence. It just means that they're unable to have access to the content in the way that they learn best. So here, it, what we're really trying to show you is that accessible format is a subset of AIM. So when we think about AIM and we think about that content, um, we're thinking about print and technology-based educational materials. We know that they're designed or enhanced in a way that makes them usable across the widest range of learner variability. So that learner variability tells us that every human being um, processes information um, and have many different preferences in, in many different ways. So no two individuals process information the exact same way. And so when we are designing accessible materials, we know that they're designed in a way that makes them usable across all variability, regardless of format that students are using. Now, when we think about accessible formats as a subset of AIM, we know that an accessible format is an alternative manner or form. They are accessing it in a different form. Um, it's used exclusively by an eligible 
person. So a committee comes together to make that determination. And we're going to talk about that um, in that four step process here in just a bit. We know that it's static text and images can be converted to accessible formats. Um, when, when we put those static text text and images in there using that accessible format, then it becomes accessible to the students. And then examples um, of this would be digital text, large print, audio braille, tactile graphics. Um, so thinking about how accessible formats are a subset of AIM. Yeah, and just do a quick check if you are an educator who is still in the classroom or just you're providing professional development, just one quick way to check to see if the text is actually editable is just take your cursor over your PDF or whatever materials you're sharing. And if you are unable to highlight any of the words on that document, that means it's not accessible, which means a text reader or a screen reader will not be able to recognize the text on there. So that's a just kind of a quick way um, um, just to check to see if the text will be um, usable by assistive technology. Pardon the clicking, y'all. My screen <laughs> went down. Um, but that's okay. We're going to get a quick review as we get right back to accessible <laughs> formats as a subset of AIM. <laughs> so when we think about this, um, let's feel free to drop into chat or unmute. Um, what questions, if any, do you still have about the differences between accessible educational materials and accessible formats? Yeah, we invite you to respond, but you don't have to at all. We have impeccable wait time. Better now than when I was in the classroom. Had I gone back into the classroom, my wait time would be way better. <laughs> All right, well, if at any time y'all have questions that arise, please feel free to drop them in chat and we're happy to circle back around and um, learn about it together. So now let's get into the four step decision making process. All of the information that we just gave you really sets us up to looking through this four step process to help us make um, informed decisions um, as a committee um, for those individuals who need and um, are eligible for accessible formats. So the first thing I want to show you is I'm going to bring over my web page here. And on the National um, Center on Accessible Educational Materials webpage, and that is aem.cast org, and I'm sure Kelly will drop it in chat. Um, everything that we're going over is housed on this website. You have access to it. You can go back to it. You can share it. Um, I also want to let you know that anything on the AIM Center website is um, Creative Commons, and that means that you can take it and make it your own. Take it, adapt it, use it. Um, we just ask that you give credit to the AIM Center whenever you're using it and sharing it with others. Um, but when I come to the acquire um, tab right here at the top, if you go right down to where it says decision making and accessible formats, this is where we are really taking the bits and pieces from this four step process for our presentation today. So it walks you through, it has additional links that you can utilize. So if we're looking at step one, which we're about to look at, determining the lear learner's need, you can click on it and it gives you information. It gives you some videos that you can access um, to help support your understanding of step one in this decision-making process. Um, so just want to let you know that that is there and available for um, your use and for sharing with um, any of your um, coworkers as well. So remember I talked about going back into the home base and opening up that highlighted section of student profiles. Um, I'm going to ask that we go ahead and just take a quick moment to do that if you haven't already. So in the home base document, if you will... Um, Click follow all the way down to the bottom and you will access the um, highlighted section that says student profiles. And I'm trying my best. My mouse is not friendly right now. Um, but where it says make a copy of profiles of Monica, Juan, and Allie. And if you will click on that, it is going to force 
you to make a copy. When you make a forced copy, this copy is yours. It's going to be saved in your Google Drive, and you can take notes on it that are only going to be seen by you. Um, so here are your student profiles. And let's just take a moment to read through these profiles of these three individuals, Monica, Juan, and Allie. So we'll just take a silent moment for you all to kind of read through and think about one student that you would like to consider as you think about these four steps that we're gonna move through. All right, so as we go through, and, and you might not have had the chance to read through all of them, um, but you have three student profiles here who you can consider and think about as we go through this process. Um, and if you have a student that you work with on the daily basis or maybe a student in the past that you would rather consider, feel free to do that as well. We just wanna really think about the students and their needs as we go through these. Um, together. My mouse, y'all, is acting a little wonky. So, um, Kelly, in just a bit, I'm going to let you take over sharing. Um, so, I'll let you pull that up as I keep going. It just keeps turning me off. <laughs> okay. All right. So, step one in this decision making process is all about determining the student's need for accessible formats. So, when we think about students who we might consider as being somebody that we need to come together and have a conversation about whether or not they need accessible formats, what comes to your mind? What are one to three indicators that you typically look for? Um, Feel free to drop it in chat and there's no wrong answer. It's just, what are some things that, you know, ooh, they might need to access this content using a different format if I notice X, Y, and Z. They don't seem to be processing information being shared as it is, absolutely. Maybe they have a reading disability, kiss your brain. Maybe they struggle with um, perception of reading materials, um, absolutely. And so when we go to this website here and we go to determining a student's lead, uh, need, it will identify three different considerations and possibilities when you're determining that student's needs. The first one is, does evidence show that the learner can read and access information from that same text-based instructional material in the same format used across the curriculum by all students? So you're gonna ask yourself, you know, are they able to access and really make progress and um, be engaged in the material as it is 
used by all students. If not, that might be a consideration. Oh, wow, we need to come together and we really need to make some um, decisions and really talk about a student's need. The second thing is that evidence shows that the learner is experiencing difficulty reading or accessing some or all text-based materials due to formats used in the curriculum. Now, a lot of times we typically think of um, just looking at some of the, the, the chat items, we typically think of visual impairments um, as, oh, a student might need Braille, they might need an uh, accessible format, but we also want to really think about that determination of eligibility because it's beyond um, visual and um, hearing impaired. It's, it's really about students who have perceptions, physical disabilities, students who struggle with the reading processing, moving their eyes from one way to another. So many different aspects can be considered in that eligibility piece. Some sources of evidence. So when you come together with a team, and your team can be an IEP team, if it's a student who receives special education services, it might be a 504 team, it can be an MTSS um, team where you're really looking at um, interventions for the students and talking about them. Any team identified who has that educational knowledge to really understand what the student needs are, um, they come together and they have conversations and they look at the data and they look at the evidence. And some of that evidence is parent-teacher observations. So we not only want to hear what the teachers are providing as observations, but as a parent, I want to be able to show you and tell you what I'm also seeing at home when the student, when my child is working. I'm having conversations with the students, asking them, you know, um, Oregon is doing a really great job about student advocacy, right? Self-advocacy and really asking them, what is it that you need? What is it that's helping you? When we have those conversation pieces with students, it's providing us with an insight of, oh, wow, I didn't realize that, but he's finding it, um, she's finding it very helpful. So let's consider this as a possibility. Um, we could use student achievement. You know, um, I know some of our um districts and states that we work with, they use different, um, you know, resources and tools. A lot of them use UPAR and they look at how is a student achieving if they are being provided text and it's being read aloud to them? How are the students doing if they're provided printed text? Um, and they look at that student achievement based off of the resources, the formats, the tools that they're experimenting with to see what, what is benefiting the student. Of course, you can utilize reading assessment scores and diagnostic um, evaluations. But what else can we use to help us um, come to the table to say, hey, we have some data. We need to talk about what this student needs and if the student needs accessible formats. Um, I think we can also think about um, ability for students to comprehend what they're reading um, as they're going through it, if they're unable to keep up with the processing. So I had a student who really struggled with um, being able to process information when read on text-based or printed-based um, text because of um, you know, just attention um, details. And so they weren't able to process and understand the information, but whenever they were able to utilize it and it was read aloud to them using um, a screen reader or using um, speech to text or any of those resources, they were able to comprehend. They were able to focus a little bit more. So it's really thinking about that need um, versus just simply looking at whether or not they are eligible. Yeah, and I think one of the most power co powerful components is just asking that student, right? What they don't know, they don't know. Um, these are our students who just feel like they're not smart when really they don't know what exists out there. So helping those students explore on different modalities on the way to access um, information can be um, can be key. So, so one of the key questions, I'm sorry, one of the key no. questions for teams is, 
can the student access and use the text-based materials that's used in the general education curriculum? If it's yes, awesome, right? They are thriving. If it's no, then that tells us we need to come together and make some um, decisions and talk about what the student needs in order to access that. Yeah, and, and access meaning um, what can they use to access it? So this sometimes becomes to the terms where accommodations versus modifications, if the, if the student can actually comprehend and engage in grade level curriculum, that student should have access to grade level curriculum. So it's just depending on how they're gonna access that is going to be going to be different. There are so, three different possibilities that um, we can look at, right? So when we come together, we ask that question, there's three different possibilities that it can be. Possibility one is that evidence is showing that the learner can read and access the information um, that's provided to all students within the curriculum. And, and the outcome of that was awesome. Accessible formats are not needed, right? They are able to really engage with, um, make sense of, and access that content. So we can just keep on providing it for them. But then there's a possibility too. And possibility two, the evidence shows that the learner is experiencing some difficulty reading or accessing some or all text-based materials due to the formats that are currently being utilized in the curriculum. So what happens then is that the team comes together and they anticipate that the student will make adequate progress if exactly the same information, the exact same information is presented in one or more accessible formats. If I take the same information and I provide access through um, a braille reader or a large print, the student will have the ability to access, engage in a seamless manner um, as their peers who are non-disabled. And so in this case, one or more accessible formats are needed at this time. And then Kelly, I know that there's a third one. What is that third possibility? <laughs> So the evidence shows that the learner needs modified content, such as a lower reading level or change in what the student is expected to learn. So in some cases, the learner may need that modified content in accessible format. So there is still that need. Um, creating AIM for some students um, still, you know, is going to need maybe some interventions when it comes to um, literacy skills just for um you know, different reasons. So the outcome would be the team determines what, whether the learner needs modified content only or a combination of modified content and accessible format. So it's essentially still doing that um, intervention with students, but still providing those accessible formats. Um, so the students can engage and interact and respond to the content in the most independent way that they can access. So determining need. Determining need always, always, always comes before determining eligibility. Before we even start to think about eligibility, the student has to show us that they need us to talk about eligibility, that they need us to really think about things further. So we always wanna look at what is the student's need, and then once the need is determined, eligibility is used to determine the sources from which accessible formats may be provided. So if the student needs it, then we look at eligibility to tell us where can we get it from? What sources can we use to provide this to the students? Yeah, and I love this because when we think about accessibility with our instruction and materials that we're giving our students, we just interviewed a, a lovely educator in Maryland for our podcast, and she teaches a preschool uh, pre-K students with blindness, low vision, and she said which, you know, I may be preaching to the choir here is when I make my materials accessible for my students is not making it inaccessible for other students. However, if you're making your, if you're not making your materials, you know, accessible for her students, then it is inaccessible. So it's about, you know, when we're creating accessibility from the start, all students can engage and interact with the content, whether they're eligible um, or not. And so this is just a reminder that eligibility, um, it applies um, only to copyrighted works. And so those copyrighted works, those require students to be eligible and meet that eligible uh, eligibility requirements. But 
you know, think about going open, um, that's available to, to anybody. So when we think about copyrighted, eligibility has to be determined, but there are other pathways that we can access um, sources if a student requires, um, requires it. And so let's think about that eligible person, because this is a huge discussion um, around, you know, the nation. It's like, who, who could be eligible? And so um, eligible, eligible person is defined as an individual who, regardless of any other disability, is blind, um, has a visual impairment or perceptual or reading disability that cannot be improved to give visual function substantially equivalent to that of a person who has no such impairment or disability and so is unable to read printed works to substantially the same degree as a person without an impairment or disability or is otherwise unable through physical ability to hold or manipulate a book or to focus or move the eyes to the extent that would be normally acceptable for reading. Um, now, here's the thing. A lot of people say, man, there's some gray area in here. And yes, absolutely. Um, but that's where um, we come back to our team, right? We come to our team and these are the guidelines. This is what it says eligible person is. And together it is our responsibility to determine whether or not a student based off of this criteria meets eligible person. So Kelly, who can certify an eligible person? Yeah, so now as um, a doctor of medicine, doctor of uh, psychologist, a registered nurse, and there's multiple people now that can uh, just certify your student to be el eligible. It used to be really hard, as we all, most of us know, <laughs> to get a doctor's note. Like that was the huge barrier. So we're really um, fortunate to have the, the shift in that access to uh, certify um, a student who's eligible. So once we've determined that student needs, step two is to select the format that is needed. And so it's a team process, right? There's no I in team. We come together and we consider the full learning context. We look at the whole child. We observe the learning trial, a range of formats. We look at what's working for them. Um, how are they progressing when we use different things? We're talking to the students. And then we select a format, or it could be a combination of formats. Um, the next thing we want to do is we want to list the text-based materials used across the curriculum. Really important here because when we're thinking about providing accessible materials and in those accessible formats in a timely manner, we need to make sure that we know what curriculum is being utilized so that we can access it um, in that you know accessible format that the child needs. And then match formats to materials that the student needs. Yes, and, and and also we're talking about students who are eligible, but best practice is to create your materials accessible from the beginning because you never know. Some students may use text-to-speech, but then the next day some, some students may need to enlarge the text. We really don't know. So it's it's best practice for all, all of our learners um, that we're creating our materials that are in uh, capable of being changed to any uh, different format. And you know what I really also want to point out, because this has popped up um, in my personal life as well, when we think about accessible formats and we're looking at it across all of the curriculum, because if a student needs large print and reading, if they're reading math, they're going to need that accessible format across the different content areas. And a lot of times, um, because people don't know what they don't know, um, it's we provide it in reading, oh, but we're not going to provide it in these other areas. But if a student needs, they have a true need for that accessible format, um, we need to look at what's being utilized across all different content areas for their curriculum so that we can make sure that we're um, providing all of those pieces to them in that accessible format. Michelle, may I make a comment? Yes. Uh, this is Deb. And, you know, often uh, because we support therapists as well, we know that therapists, uh, uh, if they're presenting their material to somebody, um, that they need to read. These things are important. But also for our OTs and thinking, it's not just the hearing of it, but it's also the being able to interact with it. And mm -hmm. so if a student has handwriting difficulties or is it's hard for them to complete a worksheet, 
putting a, an accessible document in front of them that allows them to use voice recognition, et cetera, uh, to complete those tasks. Uh, that, I just wanted to mention that because that definitely falls under the scope of uh, what our uh, OTs in particular are trying to help a student to do. Deb, I love that you said that, right? Because using tech, we have to think, what are we assessing? What are we testing? Are we testing their ability to handwrite? Or we really want the students to be able to express their knowledge and what they know. So um, um, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, that's a really important piece to all of this. All right, so once we've determined their need, we've identified the appropriate accessible format that they need, the next step is to acquire the format needed. And we do this through what we call AMPs, but that stands for Accessible Media Producers. Um, and there's, as you see, you know, several different options that you can look into. Bookshare, which is, um, you know, digital text. Um, we have, um, and, and Braille reading, we have Learning Ally, which is voice text. We have um, APH in the Louis database, um, your IMC, RIC, IRC. We also have publishers. So if that curriculum is, um, a textbook, you know, we want to go to the NIMES files, the source files that they have there to identify through their IBN that number on the, the, the textbook. Hey, do you have this in this accessible format? Um, and then also there's multiple local conversions. All of this information can be found on the AIM Center website with additional information about different accessible media producers. Um, so I would encourage anybody um, who wants to explore this further to check it out. Um, go and read up about some of these different AMPs, accessible media producers. Um, and then of course, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. We're happy to help in any way. So this is, wait a minute, right? This is complex. How can our team, our students, and their families avoid having to go through the eligibility and AMP process. Well, that's simple, right? We can make sure that we have processes and procedures in place to purchase accessible from the beginning, which I know, um, you know, that's what we're working towards in our AIM cohort. We're looking at those processes. And of course, you always um, can use open educational resources. Remember, the eligibility is tied to copyrighted materials. And so look at other ways that you can go and explore accessible materials um, with, without having to go through that. But best practice um, is to purchase accessible from the beginning when possible. Yes. And when you're using open educational resources, they're not always accessible. So oftentimes when you get those supplemental resources from OER, you'll really have to think about the accessibility and ensure that your students can interact and engage um, and decode the content that's in the OER. And you know what's to follow step four. So we've gone through all of this. We've identified their need. We identified the appropriate um, accessible format. We um, have gone through the sources of where they can receive that accessible format. Now we have to support. Um, so we need to make sure that we're identifying the necessary assistive technology. We need to train, 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 and we need to train anybody and everybody who's going to be supporting that student using their accessible um, formats. As a mom, train me. I need help. I need, I need information so that I can support that at home as well. Um, personalize instructional strategies as needed. You know, this will tie into the, any accommodations um, that students might require. Um, that specially designed instruction is the teach piece. Hey, you've got your need, but I need to instruct you on how to use this and how to self-manage this. Um, describe services and accommodations in the IEP and 504 plan. Why? because mobility and students move around and we wanna make sure that if they go from one place to the other, it is documented. Any type of strategies that they um, really rely on is documented so that they don't have to start over from square one. And then of course, progress monitor over time. And as you progress monitor, reflect on the data to see, do we need to come back together and relook at these decisions? Is something um, not working or is something working really well? Um, have those conversation pieces because we want to make sure that our students have what they need, when they need it, and how they need it. So let's take some time. If there's any questions that Kelly and I can um, answer in any way, please feel free to unmute or drop them in chat. 
obviously this is just that touching <laughs> the the little basics of you know four step there's so much more to dig into i'm still digging into it i'm sure kelly's still digging into it um but together we dig in and we learn more and so feel free to to ask away i have a question um when we talk about the step one of um you know, evaluating the student's need for accessible educational materials. I wonder, are you aware of or of any kinds of processes or systems that teams use to do that? You gave us a great list of uh, possible sources of data, but I'm wondering if if you worked with any teams that, that have a particular like step-by-step -step way of doing that, looking at the need for AIM. Kelly, uh, do you have any that you can think of off the off the bat? I don't have any processes for determining that need. Um, let me. There is something on our website that um, North Carolina has shared, and that is the AIM planning form, mm -hmm. um, and that is really to support um, that process of once we know that they need it to list out that curriculum and to identify who's going to reach out to our NIMAC NIMAS, who's going to um, make sure we go through the process. So let me find it on the website. I'll drop it in chat and I'll add it to our home base document so that everybody has access to that as well. But Kelly, you might know um, any other processes. Yeah. So determining like which the format is like the most appropriate and, the, and where students could be the most proficient in comprehension. Um, I know some uh, many states and districts use, which Gail, I'm sure you're very familiar with is UPAR, Universal Protocol for Accommodations and Reading. So that will right away, um, not for all students, but can determine what a student is most proficient in comprehension when it comes to independent reading. So that's decoding um, a text reader or the more human uh, reader voice. I know a lot of districts that do that. That's one piece. And I feel like I can visualize my Google folder now that has tons of other resources that I can't get to right now that um, we're happy to share and maybe put on that home base doc, Michelle, um, yes. for some things to explore. And I love that. Yeah. And I don't know why I didn't jump over to this, but um, we do have the AIM Navigator mm -hmm. um, on the website. So let me um, let me share this really quickly. Oh, wait. yeah, okay. Let me see if I can share. Work with me, work with me. So we have our AIM Navigator. Um, I will say that it hasn't been updated since 2021, so it's in the works to be updated, but this really does help you walk through that decision-making process. Um, and so if you just click right here on the download the AIM Navigator, you're going to see that within the table of contents, um, you know, it has all the pieces that we've covered today, but then it also has, um, you know, when you go to section one of determining a need, here it gives you the options, but then here it, you know, talks to you about different checkpoints. The team considers the full learning context. You know, have we considered the student's skills, the student's needs? And so this is definitely something that um, can support that decision-making process. Um, let me see, go back over here. Um, so you have all four steps, plus you have in the appendix um, um, just different resources and questions that you can consider with your team. Um, step two, um, when we're looking at checkpoint one, um, there's... Uh, decision-making selection of accessible formats to consider the full learning context. Here's what aspects of the student's current skills should the team consider. So these are just questions that you can maneuver through um, you know, to guide you on that. Michelle, in Oregon, um, we're very familiar. I love that worksheet that you were just showing. In Oregon, we're very familiar often with using the SET framework. And I love how the student environment and tasks um, aspect of the set framework is built into that game na navigator worksheet. So um, I, I'm glad that you pulled those things up so that people could see they are available. I, and I want to say too, your website is full of useful things like that. I've been spending a lot of time with your website um, lately, and I'm so impressed with all the different uh, resources that you've created and are providing. Um, on that same area where the AIM Navigator resource is, um, 
am I sharing my screen? Yes. Yeah. All right here, the North Carolina's AIM planning form. So if you click on this, this is what North Carolina has used. And it just is to really help that pipeline of making sure that everybody knows what their responsibility is. Um, so right down here, you know, it asks you to write down the ISBN number of any of those textbooks that they have. Um, and then, you know, is it on the state adoption because they're a state adoption title grade level. So it just really, um, and then here, selecting the format required. So then this then goes up to the, the chain, whoever's ordering and looking and having those conversations with the vendors or their NIMAC state contacts so that they can look and search um, for these books. So this is here as well. And if we um, come into contact with any others, we will definitely make yes. sure that we um, share that. Yes. And our time is up, friends. We are so grateful for this time that we've been, been able to spend with you. Resources that we've been talking to, at, uh, talking about the end, we'll make sure that we put on that home base doc. And if you have any um, questions or concerns or anything about what we talked about, obviously in Oregon, you have like a stellar group leading the charge there who is on this call right now yes. um, <laughs> for to support you, but also know that we're on your team and we are happy to support any questions that you may have. And if we don't know the answers, friends, we will certainly dig and find uh, the right people to make sure that they can support you as well.